It's time to sit back and check out the RCWR show with Lee Sanders. Get fun, in-depth coverage and analysis from the latest in professional wrestling in AEW, WWE, NWA, Impact Wrestling, or the world of entertainment. From hit TV shows to your favorite sports like the NBA or NFL, all things music, movies, and beyond. While trying to make sense of this crazy world, we all while keeping it honest, insightful, and interactive since 2011. And now your host, live from the nation's capital of Washington, D.C., Lee Sanders. Hey, my pretty babies, what is going on? Covering the latest in wrestling, entertainment, and beyond since 2011. You guys are checking out a special late Sunday night, early Monday morning edition of the RCWR show as we are covering AEW Dynasty pay-per-view fallout. I got to tell you, I was looking at this pay-per-view and I pretty much saw everything, including Zero Hour for the most part, by the way, sound off. Let me know what you thought about tonight's AEW Dynasty pay-per-view event. I got the polls open on X, formerly known as Twitter, and on the YouTube channel. Just use the keywords, the RCWR show for our YouTube channel. Make sure you click on the Communities tab, and you'll see our poll that way. And we'll see how you guys are voting much later on during the show. I do appreciate those of you that's finding yourself to be trickling on in. If you did happen to stay up and checked out this pay-per-view, because when it's all said and done, it's not like a major holiday is coming up on Monday. It's a regular work day. People still have to work. There are a lot of people that are still in school and all that around this time, right? So I found it interesting the longer that this pay-per-view went. Now, I know for some people, they won't care. And before anybody goes with the whole, well, this other company over here, they normally do. That's not what I'm talking about. I don't care who the company is. I just know when it's a Sunday night, and there's no major holiday hitting on a Monday and people got work in school the very next day. You're looking at that clock, right? Because you got that mental clock in the back of your head going, man, I know I need to go to bed soon because otherwise, man, I'm going to be dragging like a mofo the next day. This was I'll give Tony Khan and them credit. They made sure that this was wrapped up right before midnight because by the time the pay-per-view ended it was just at least two minutes three minutes top shy of hitting the midnight hour which would have made it a four hour pay-per-view event when all said and done and i know a lot of people are like wait a minute we did four hours for this one yeah look can we be all in agreement that some of the matches that was on the card for tonight as far as the time length goes it could have been trimmed down here and there. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I did tell you guys a couple of weeks ago that as far as myself goes with AEW programming, I would still check out Rampage. I would still check out the Battle of the Belt specials. I would represent on the pay-per-views before the TV shows and Collision and Dynamite. I pretty much was clocking out on those, but as far as what went down tonight with AEW Dynasty, I felt that overall card was pretty good. Let's jump right into this because, you know, it's, it's a lot of matches. So I want to try to bang these out as quick as humanly possible, but definitely show you guys some love at the same time and hear you all's thoughts on uh, a lot of these matches. Favorite match, worst match, high point of the night, low point of the night, zero hour Trent Beretta defeating Matt Seidel via submission came at about the eight minute mark. I sadly did not see that. I came in, I was out running errands. I came in at the start of Shibata and Orange Cassidy taking on Shane Taylor 
promotions, Shane Taylor and Lee Moriarty, uh, tag match team of Shibata and Cassidy picking up the win. 12 minutes, 40 seconds. Good stuff for that zero hour. By the way, I did happen to see, because I watched the stream of Zero Hour via YouTube. I saw at one point there was at least 48,000 live, uh, I, I guess you could say, I won't say uh, viewers. That's the word I wanted to use. I was thinking something else. I don't know why, but viewers. They had at one point live 48,000 viewers. That's pretty good. That's actually pretty, pretty damn good. Uh, nice match, though. I enjoyed this one. It's kind of funny when I think about it because I go back just about a little over 24 hours ago. And remember, we had got a live rampage that was part of a three-hour block in AEW programming with collision and everything. And I was saying to the community over on the Full One Mania site, hey, isn't it interesting that we've had Roderick Strong be the focal point these past couple of rampages and i said to them you know i don't know about you guys but it's kind of growing on me a little bit here right because i'm digging roderick strong's matches and everything this is nice to take a little bit of a breather from orange cassidy and everything and then it never dawned on me i don't know if it did for you guys but it never dawned on me that probably during zero hour we were going to get orange cassidy and as soon as I heard the music and all that, I'm going, oh, this is where he is. Okay, all right, so we got him now on Zero Hour. Okay, nice change of pace and everything. He's not on the actual main card. Okay, whatever, that's cool. But nice tag match between all these participants for what it was worth. Your third pre-show hour matchup was Bullet Clubs, Jay White, Austin, and Colton Gunn defeating the acclaimed in a winner takes all title unification match for the AEW World Trios Championship and the ROH World Six-Man Tag Team Championship. Is that a tongue full or is that a tongue full? So that is it. Winner takes all. Belts are now going to be fused. I would imagine we're going to get a new set of tag uh, championships. We're going to get a new design, all that, I, I would imagine. We'll see what happens, but it is what it is. Uh, I love the diss that my man Max Caster had put out there on the uh, on the Bullet Club Gold guys. Uh, too raunchy for me to say here on the show, but let's just say one of the things that he said to them had to do with them sucking on a particular anatomy of a male. And I'll just leave it at that. But, I mean, he was he was good tonight. I got to say, Max Caster really brought that sauce, man. He brought that fire, especially when he said, yo, cut my music off. And he went acapella on the Bullet Club, guys. Loved it. I loved it. Good stuff right there. Match itself, uh, you know what? I'll say this. It was a good tag match. Don't get me wrong. It was a tag match. Good tag match. I will say this. I'm a little bit concerned about the acclaimed. I really am. I don't know if you guys are concerned with the acclaim as well, but the frequency of these guys making appearances on television, right? You're, you're looking at that. And then if you're fans of Bullet Club Gold, if you're particularly fans of Jay White, you definitely were looking at the tail end of 2003 and you're saying, man, I'm not really feeling the way things are going for Jay White. He's coming off like a chump here. And it just seems like since the start of 2024, as I've brought up a couple of times so far, seems like Jay White is creatively wise getting back in the right footing, right? He's getting the right type of pacing and all that. So I look at this win for Bullet Club Gold, more particularly for Jay White as a good thing when it's all said and done. I'm curious to see how things will further develop uh, right here for these guys. I'm, I'm pulling for them, but at the same time, I'm also looking at the acclaimed and I'm going, what exactly, what, what what's going on here? What does the future hold for these guys? Because, you know, I hate to dive in the rumors and all that other stuff, but just some of the stuff that I saw that was floating around on social media, you're, you're just looking and you're going, is everything okay here? Like, seriously, you know, but the match itself, first half, not really too much to talk about. 
but they did pick it up in the second half, closing out pretty strong. Shout out to Billy Gunn. I'm just amazed at the fact that this dude can continue to defeat Father Time, man. Main show, we go to AEW Continental Championship. Okada defending against the bastard known as Pac. Okada retaining his championship at the 21 minute 55 second mark. I am loving me some Okada. I, I will not lie to you guys. I checked out a lot of his stuff over from New Japan Pro Wrestling, often on these handful of years. And I love the guy. I, I do appreciate the fact that we get to see this man on a weekly basis as a North American uh, Canadian audience and everything. Uh, this was a very good, strong opener. I like the placement of this matchup. It really set the tone as far as things to come. Fantastic matchup. I continue to be in awe of Okada's heel work. He really knows how to work up the crowd so good, right? And you have to forgive me, I, you know, even though I've been seeing a lot of Okada's matches over the years, I sadly haven't seen him in enough story arcs. So if he's done the heel work before, then that's news to me because I, I didn't check out New Japan like that, right? I would only check out key stuff online, sometimes at recommendations and all that. You guys get the gist. But I'm loving, I've seen enough of his work to know how he operates as a babyface is my point. Never have I seen any work of his as a heel. So to see how he has been handled so far by Tony Khan and crew, I'm loving it. I particularly loved his work tonight and working up the crowd. I remember at one point, I think he was teasing the fact that he was getting ready to do the Rainmaker and the fans were pretty much all, yeah, and he just right on cue. Threw up a middle finger to all four sections of the arena, letting the fans, nah, 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 nah. You're not going to be able to enjoy this moment. This is pretty much my moment. And loved it. Great stuff right there. Loved it. Shame that Pac uh, had to lose in this big match, this big field match. Uh, like, the guy literally just returned. But at the same time, you're looking at this match and you're going, yeah, there's no way Okada, newly signed, just coming in, no way he's going to be losing this early in his run with the company. But at the same time, if you're a fan of Pac, you're looking at him and you're going, damn, not really feeling how they're doing this, man. Wish this man would just get maybe released so he can go test out greener pastures elsewhere. Shout out to Matt Hardy. Thought that was fantastic what happened with him. At the most recent TNA pay-per-view over the weekend. I don't know if you guys had heard about that. Now the question becomes, what kind of... It looks like Broken Hardy, doesn't it? But is it going to be a Broken Hardy that gets freshened up? But if you're a fan of Pac, you're, you know what I'm saying? You're looking at what's going on with Matt Hardy and some of the other recent releases over these past half full of months, including what went down less than 36 hours ago. And you're going, okay, like, I know what this individual is capable of. They just need the right team behind them to, because every time, whether I was watching Pac down in NXT or on the main roster of WWE, the man was always freaking entertaining. If I knew that guy was wrestling, I knew, okay, I'm good. I'm good no matter whatever story arc they got this man in. Even if it's a comedic joint that I could care two craps about. I could take comfort knowing that when it comes to ring time, Pac is going to freaking deliver. And it just sucks that we continue to see this guy come up with the short end uh, of the stick here. But fun match. Fun opener. Fun opener. From there, our trios match. Adam Copeland. Eddie Kingston and Mark Briscoe taking on the House of Black. So let me see if I got this straight when it comes to this match, right? By the way, House of Black picking up the win. Let, let me see if I got this straight because we saw some crazy stuff that went down in this match, including uh, Copeland hitting a spear. Um, I, I don't know who he uh, had hit that on. Uh, I don't know if it was. I don't know if it was Black. Or if it was 
Brody King. I don't know which one it was, but I remember he he hit a spear and all that. We see like all this foul stuff that's going on in this matchup, right? And this match was very hard hitting. I mean, definitely very physical. You can say, ah, all the matches are fit. No, this one particularly, they really were laying it all out there. Some of the spots was insane. But you would have thought that, okay, with the way this match has been laid out so far, the tempo that you're picking up, okay, we're going to end on a really good strong note here. And on the contrary, the way this match pretty much ends after everything that went down physically, Copeland gets sprayed in the face with this black mist by Malachi Black. One, two, three, and that's pretty much it. I, I got to take off a demerit, man. I, I got to take off a point for that. I mean, seriously, that that was just... <laughs> Like, like, come on, man, really? You do all this other crazy stuff. Like, oh, but the Black Mist, that's gonna, that's gonna do it. Okay, whatever. Putting that to the side. I gotta say, I am really liking the team of Mark Briscoe, Adam Copeland, Eddie Kingston. It is just a fun mixture. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're on your way, I don't know, to... Grab some lunch. You're on your way to the store, whatever. A funny thing happened on the way to the, and you fill out the blank. And somehow these three guys, you, you think, that just doesn't sound, would that work? That, that, I don't know. That trio, I, I, these guys click. I love it. These guys actually click really well together. They gel well. I want to see more matches with these guys, uh, particularly Mark Briscoe. Mark Briscoe was doing some inc- insane, crazy shit in this match. Loved it. I mean, it just fun. Fun. Went down exactly as I expected. I do appreciate how AEW kept the Malachi Black, Adam Copeland exchange slash interactions to a bare minimum. And given the way that things had played out tonight in the finish, obviously these two men, right, even though I'm not feeling the whole Black Mist thing and all that, Look, obviously, the seeds are being planted to have these two eventually face off one-on-one, and that should be a fantastic story in itself. Man, the directions that you could potentially go with that. Because I'm just, I don't know if you guys have had time to really marinate on that future program with those guys, but I can just picture Malachi Black coming out the very next week and cutting one hellacious promo talking about how, you know, I didn't just spray you with black mist. I sprayed you, you know, to, to I sprayed you with the truth, basically, right? You know how they kind of spin it in the way where we've seen over the years when Malachi Black hits a mofo with that black mist, some type of dark inner evil whatever like just comes out of that person we've seen it happen so many times before right and i would love to see that really go right because think about it for a second the adam copeland that we first got that popped up in aew the honeymoon was over really really quick and i was very grateful that he immediately jumped right into the christian cage program and all that because he got cold really really quick i think even the most hardcore aew the most hardcore overzealous aew fan will admit that that he got cold rather quickly so put that christian cage program to the side dude would have been freezing freezing cold like <laughs> <laughs> he ain't gonna fall out in 24 hours it's gonna take a few days cold okay so the fact that eventually he goes from that and then he finds his way dealing with the house of black this has so much great potential more specifically with malachi black it has so much great potential for malachi black to say you know you're just a shell of your former self thus referring to the Adam Copeland that we knew in the WWE. Basically, you're not that dog anymore, right? You don't have that bite 
anymore. Let's be honest. You've become very complacent, right? You're a family man now. You're a husband. You're a father. I would like to see it go that route. And look, I don't know what's going on with the current contract status there of uh, Beth Phoenix. But if she can somehow be incorporated in this, oh, man, you would be taking it to a whole new personal darker level so kind of have all of that going on in the back of your head because i think they are just getting started that's going to be a very promising program house rules tbs championship match julia hart defending against willow nightingale got ourselves a new tbs champion there and willow nightingale Came at the six-minute mark. Again, this was a house rules match. So as a result of this being that, Willow's stipulation was that Sky Blue and Chris Statlander were barred from ringside. Again, a six-minute match. I uh, This was really weird, man, because some people, and shout-out to everybody who I was interacting with, uh, either on social media privately or I was interacting with you all in the Discord but I saw some people point out, well, wait a minute here. And I missed it, sadly. But uh, apparently there was a really bad bump that Julia Hart had took in this match. And then there was also the rumblings that she got injured prior. And perhaps that is why the match ended up being so short. Uh, you know, of course, that's just speculation right now. I would imagine that as the media scrum is underway at the time that we're live right now, Tony Khan will maybe address some of those rumors because I'm sure that a lot of the people that's representing the media, wrestling media, uh, are aware of what's being said online and will most likely ask him for sure uh, about that and everything. But hopefully she is all right. Uh, short match, very, very short match. Got ourselves a new champion. Yeah, you're looking at this and it's kind of, it's kind of, it's, it's good. But it's bad at the same time. Let me explain. If you're a longtime fan of Willow Nightingale, then you're definitely going, yo, this is great. Like, hell yeah, Willow. Yeah, long time coming, right? And this girl, I've watched Willow since she was eye candy down in the WOW Women of Wrestling promotion long before AEW even came into existence. And I felt way back then, yo, this girl, she's got something. She's got something that is, you know, star potential right here, money-making potential right here. So to see her eventually get involved with AEW put a big old smile on my face because that just meant, okay, now... The North American, Canadian audience, they're going to see what I'm talking about. And she has not disappointed so far. So to see her become the new TBS champion, you know, if the rumors are true that Julia was hurt, could have fooled me. I would have to go back and really pay attention to Julia's offense. Could have fooled me. Willow did great. Both girls did great. But this was Willow's moment. And that's great and all. But it felt too short that there wasn't enough meat on the bones. You feel where I'm coming from? To really to really take in and embrace this victory for Willow. Because you could almost make an argument, hey, since we've seen her in AEW, this was a long time coming and everything. And then the other thing that's kind of, because there's three parts to this. So that's the Willow factor. There's the other parts of this where you're looking at Julia and you're saying, well, damn, what exactly, you know, because it kind of seemed like the force, just everything was behind this girl. And the way things just went down, you're just going, damn, just clean in the middle of the ring. Like no controversy, no, you know, something, nothing that we can have go down in a way where Julia could say, well, you only won because. Right, put a little asterisk by that one. Yeah, Willow, you won, but you won because nothing of that magnitude. And then there's the third equation to this, which is Mercedes Monet, which I gotta say, by the way, let me see if I got this right. This girl popped up in AEW what? About 
two months ago, pretty much. She still has not wrestled yet. Am I understanding that right? She has not wrestled yet. And she won't be wrestling until May's double or nothing pay-per-view event. And she is reportedly making all that money. And reportedly, there's a bunch of AEW original women wrestlers that are upset about that money that she's getting. I'm just looking at that, and it's funny as hell. But at the same time, I'm going, yo, sign me up. Find me somebody that can pay me Buku's money to do very little, in appearances particularly, right? In ring work, whatever, right? Do very little work as possible. And you can command Buku's salary. Like, seriously, that is the ultimate American dream right there, my pretty babies. That is the ultimate American dream. But you're looking at the Mercedes Monet factor because immediately after the title win, Mercedes Monet comes out to pretty much hype up this upcoming match between her and Willow at Double or Nothing. And so... Now you're looking at that and you're going, oh, damn. Does this mean Willow's going to be a freaking placeholder? That's it. She's essentially going to be a placeholder until double or nothing and then drop the title to Mercedes Monet. It, It just makes you feel numb on so many levels. I, I'm not really a fan of. Um, of this man, I, I, I'm not, you guys can sound off. Let me know what you think, but I, I just don't like the trajectory uh, of this with all those variables and just feeling at the very end, how things could potentially go down. Uh, I don't know. I don't know from there. AEW intercontinental championship, Roderick strong defending his title successfully against Kylie O'Reilly. Uh, going down at the 17-minute, 20-second mark. I knew this was going to be a fun matchup because I've been seeing little bits and pieces what's been happening with these two guys on television the past couple of weeks. That much I have seen. I, I do have my social media still, even though I've scaled back dramatically uh, on my social media activity and everything. Uh, I particularly, I saw the tag match that went down with both of these guys on Rampage over the weekend, which was a fantastic main event match, by the way. If you guys haven't watched Rampage yet, you want to see a fun tag match, go out of your way, check out the main event, because it involved Kyle O'Reilly, Kyle O'Reilly and Roderick Strong. Uh, I'm trying to remember who the tag partners were. I know it was Matt Taven, Roderick Strong, And Mike Bennett, they all took on Kylie O'Reilly. I'm trying to picture the other two in my head, but I'm having I'm blanking out on them, uh, sadly. But it was a really great tag match. That's the whole point. Not to get too sidetracked, but just looking at that tag match. To my point, I felt oh, just based off what I was seeing from Rampage, I knew this one would be a damn good one. Uh, between these two men one-on-one, and it did not disappoint. This was, and you know what? Shout out to the color commentators tonight. I believe it was Taz that brought up the fact that Roderick Strong is reminding him so much the way he moves in the ring and everything of a Dean Malenko, and I just felt, you know what? Taz hit the money on the head. This is why I've been gravitating towards Roderick Strong a lot more If you were looking for a really good technical matchup from this card tonight, you definitely found it right here between Strong and O'Reilly. I I loved it. I loved it. It was a good placement of a match, too, uh, all things considered, because you had such a very short women's match. And I just feel deep down in my bones that had a lot of potential I think if you would if the rumors are true about Julia's injury I just have this feeling that that would have gone much longer would have been a 20 minute match I I think it honestly would have probably wrapped up at about 11 12 minutes to really tell their story and everything but this match coming on after the girls I thought it was a good placement uh, this was a very technical, very methodical 
pacing type of match. I loved it here. I loved it here. I don't feel the feud is over between these guys. I would actually be shocked if it turns out that's it. You know, they've separated. They're going on. I I would really, really, really be shocked uh, at that. But, yeah, especially considering it was a clean finish on top of that. Yeah, there was a clean finish uh, with Roger Tron defeating O'Reilly. But we'll see what happens. Damn good match. I loved it. Damn good match. From there, Adam Cole. Actually, no. Tainted. No, it wasn't a clean because Wardlow got involved uh, from what I remember. Yeah, Wardlow had got involved. Uh, and then, yeah, because he had distracted the referee. It's coming back to me. He distracted the referee. Strong tried looking for a Tiger driver, but O'Reilly managed to hold on, pulled off a, guillot- a guillotine. And, uh, Strong drops him against the ropes. That's when Wardlow came out. Ref sees, uh, I think, Ref saw Wardlow maybe. Trying to think if that's what had went down. Stomach breaker on O'Reilly went down, but he bounced back up, rebounded with a lariat. He had a brain buster. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think Wardlow, but he did make his presence felt. I would actually have to go back and see because I could have sworn Wardlow did something physically. But just for the sake of the argument, no, it was just clean. No asterisk by it and everything. But Adam Cole coming out, wheeled out by Taven Bennett. You're going, oh, hey, he's he's back. Great. And of course, you hear the rumblings that's going on about Adam Cole. You're wondering if those rumors are true. Uh, yeah, what exactly is going on with his health and everything? And he decides to stand out of that wheelchair and walk down the ramp. So that was actually a pretty cool thing to see. And as everyone is heading into the ring, Wardlow is celebrating with Roderick Strong, and Adam Cole gives Wardlow this dirty look like he doesn't seem pleased uh, by the work of Wardlow. So got some seeds planted right there that eventually there's going to be some type of a betrayal there on Wardlow. Y'all's guess is as good as mine. I just threw in the towel on Wardlow a long time ago. I don't say that to be hating. I just... It's so frustrating because you look at this guy, you see this amazing specimen of a wrestler in Wardlow, the potential, and they just keep fumbling with the big man. I don't know if they're ever going to get to a position where they're going to redeem this guy for all their screw-ups in the previous years. We shall see. From there... The most talked about match on social media. And not because the match was bad or the match was good. But because who won? FTW Championship. Hook, unfortunately, losing the title to Chris Jericho. (laughs) 16 minutes, 35 seconds, FTW rules match. First of all, I couldn't believe my heart that Hook and Chris Jericho were still doing a program with one another. And we've heard Chris Jericho in interviews and talk about it a little bit on his show, talking about how, hey, I'm the guy that can help all the young talents. Look at how I elevate them. Right? In a particular case of Hook, you're looking at Hook and you're going, yeah, but... Jericho, Hook has been just fine on his own. You ain't really doing nothing for the guy, brother. Uh, Don't take my word for it, but man, the crowd, they hated them some Chris Jericho. Chance of please retire. Fozzie sucks. (laughs) I believe there was even a... F Chris Jericho chat. I mean, this crowd was savage as I don't know what. I love this crowd, the St. Louis crowd. I love them. I love them. You guys rocked. Seriously, you guys rocked. I love you guys. Uh, I'm just taking it all in with a big old smile on my face. 
as the crowd at St. Louis, Missouri, were just ripping into every single little thing that Jericho was doing. Um, this match itself, look, longtime fan of Jericho's work, but these past, God, it kind of feels like maybe almost two years, Jericho has just, that's father time. When it's all said and done, that's father time catching up to him. This was a very sluggish match with a hilarious finish. What a hilarious finish. I love that Chris Jericho kept hitting these big moves on Hook. And Hook keeps coming to his feet. And he's like, I- I'm sorry. He's almost kind of recreating the Ric Flair thing. You know, and telling Hook to stay down and everything. Finally, Jericho just pulls out a baseball bat. Cracks Hook over the head with it. And wins the FTW championship that way. And all you can do at that point. And the crowd... Right on cue. They ate this up. They booed the hell out of Chris Jericho. It was interesting because at one point, I think it was towards the end, actually, when Chris Jericho was going for the bat, Taz actually took off his commentary headset and walked over to the ring. And the crowd, all of a sudden, there was like this excitement that came from the crowd. And you're wondering, what's going on? Is somebody doing something? What exactly? And then you could finally see just out the corner to the right of your screen, Taz is right there. And you're going, oh, what's he going to do? What is this guy going to do? And and Taz just stood there, allowed Chris Jericho to, but look, Taz has said it himself. Hey, Hook can fight his own battles. He's a man. And right. But man, a bat to the head. That, That was a hilarious spot. I loved it. One, two, three, Chris Jericho, your new FTW champion. Social media goes wild. They're calling this guy the new Hulk Hogan. They are uh, going to town on Chris Jericho. You guys have got to. Why? Why? This makes no sense. How does this help Hook? Hey, how about that? Chris Jericho elevating young talent. I, I mean, the comments. Even on AEW's own social media accounts when they were saying uh, slash promoting Chris Jericho as the new FTW champion. Oh, man. They were being ripped a new left and right. I loved it. I ate it up. Hilarious stuff. Uh, How did that? But seriously, how did that help Hook? At this point, and here's the thing. I like Hook. Hook's got a great look. I think as far as hitting those age demographics, he hits them all. He, he gets the young girls. He gets those cougars. You know, you got those cougars that like them, a, a young dude, right? They're out there. You got the guys that will like him because they envy him. Some will be like, yeah, you know, I kind of wish I had that. Because what have I always said about Hook? Those of you that's been checking out the show for a long time. I've always said Tony Khan and crew in AEW in regards to Hook, they got their own Tom Holland, if you really stop and think about it, they do look kind of similar and everything, right? So they got themselves a a nice young stud, nice handsome man there in Hook. So I appreciate the way that they've been trying to market him and everything, but Hook is still very, very green. And I know he's got his respected training from his dad and all that. You know, but there were many points where I was looking at this match and I'm going, man, Hook is still very green. He's coming along, but he's still very green. And if the rumors are true that his contract is coming up for some type of a renewal or it's about to expire and there's a renewal option, there's no renewal option. You know, I I really hope that him with help from his dad really explore his options and try to go with the best option that will see him really blossom as you know mainly an in-ring competitor. I, I think he can do so much more if he had the right set of coaches, access to the right people and all that. And, you know, sometimes you just look at a situation and you go, okay, you know what? I've learned everything that I could. I've reached a certain limit and, you know, there's no shade to these guys, but, you know, this is for me in furthering, extending, bettering myself, uh, extending my knowledge, 
right? There's nothing wrong with taking your ball and going elsewhere. I'm curious to see what's going to happen uh, with Hook there, but uh, this was this was not good. The crowd definitely in attendance. They were not feeling this match. I definitely uh, was not feeling this. For my personal two cents from a distance, I felt this match went way too long. Okay, way too long. But I can't help but go, where exactly are we headed with this? Right? Is Taz going to extract some type of revenge? Like, where where exactly are we going with this? Are we going anywhere with this? I have to wait and see. With Chris Jericho there. Winning another championship at what, 53, 54, 55 years old? Yay, Jericho. Anyway, AEW, Women's World Championship, timeless Tony Storm, successfully defending the title against Thunder Rosa. There was a little bit of power that was at play here in the final moments of this matchup. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love to hear final moments of this one. Tony Storm goes back looking for a Texas clover leaf, but Thunder Rosa refuses to tap out. She grabs the ropes, try and break the hold, managed to pull off uh, a backstabber on Thunder Rosa. Did Tony Storm? And uh, she gets in a modified Cobra clutch on Storm, but Storm is able to grab the apron, forces another break. Uh, Storm is kicking uh, away uh, Rosa and all of that. <laughs> I'm, I'm just picturing the visual. You guys got to forgive me. I'm just picturing the visual in my head, and it, it's just hilarious. But we've got uh, Mariah May who jumps up on the apron and she's causing a scene. Deanna Perrazzo gets involved and they're just slugging it out and everything. Next thing you know, while the referee is not looking, cause you got to go back inside the ring, right? Tony storm just out of nowhere kicks my girl, thunder Rosa in the woo. Got y'all in check. <laughs> Falls on the ground. Storm zero, one, two, three. That's it hilarious stuff man i i gotta tell you i did not i didn't have that on my bingo card man that would have been a great DraftKings little thing like the over and under hey do you think tony storm is gonna kick thunder rosa in the woo-ha <laughs> I mean, seriously <laughs> good stuff from both of these women um i gotta say good stuff kudos to them because i would imagine they probably Felt the vibe, saw the vibe and all that from the crowd from the previous match with Hook and Jericho. And they probably said to themselves, God damn, we got to follow up that. Right. It's bad enough that sometimes you, know, you got that crowd that they don't care about the women's matches. It's a mere break, and, you know, and all that other crap. But I'm sure they probably looked at that kind of shook their heads and at the same time probably said to themselves and, you know, each other and all that, yo, let's go out there and let's really give these fans something to talk about. Let's really bust our ass to entertain these guys. And I appreciate that hustle because, uh, look, uh, I said it in the Discord, as a matter of fact, that Hook Jericho match, as far as a low point of the night, that definitely was it. I could have done without seeing that match. That's just me personally to each its own. We can disagree. It's okay. Don't mind having a discussion about it, but I could have done uh, without that matchup. But these two women put in some really good stuff uh, here. Tony Storm's reign continues. Uh, it still feels like there's a lot of fun creativity left in it. You know, there's so much untapped potential. So I can see this reign definitely going another three four months with the right material and, and all of that. So I, uh, I can't wait to see where this goes. And by the way, nice way how they booked Thunder Rosa there. They booked that girl pretty strong because at one point she did get hit with a storm zero, but she managed to kick out of it. And that just, you know, me being a long time Thunder Rosa fan, that made me go, okay, well maybe tonight's going to be her night, but 
you know, as we later would find out, not so much, not so much. From one really good, solid match, you notice the trend here. We're kind of, we start off on a high point with the match, and then we kind of go low a little bit, and then we kind of pick things back up, and then we hit a really good high mark, which is at this point, Will Ospreay taking on Brian Danielson. Definitely a match of the year candidate. Now, I got to reel some of my friends and colleagues back a little bit. We got some of them, you know, they're kind of they're kind of drooling a little bit too much. We got some of them saying, oh, my God, this was the greatest wrestling match that I've ever seen in my entire life. And I'm just going, "Ooh, damn, that's pretty. Those are some ballsy words there, man, like. In your entire life, as long as you've been watching wrestling, like this, this is the one that you really want to, right? Uh, for your entire life. Like, if you want to say, yo, that match definitely was an instant classic. Without a doubt, that's a match of the year candidate. I can't believe what I just saw. Man, that was insane. Like, I'm with you. But when we start saying, yo, <laughs> in my entire life, right? That That's got to be... The most fantastic wrestling match ever since the creation of wrestling. Like, when we start saying stuff like that, it's kind of, wait a minute, let's check ourselves here. But I will say, I love this match. I, I am guilty as charged. Loved, 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 loved. This was a banger. Classic. Definitely in my match of the year candidate folder you know how i do it here on the show I, I usually have a little folder and right and then at the end of the year i go back and and see my little notations and all that uh i gotta give it the highest mark of the night although i think we could have scaled back a little bit on the time i thought for sure we were gonna have ourselves almost an hour match if not over but i don't think there was ever an argument that this match would not deliver, right? Whether you could make the argument, man, this was a match for an audience of one being Dave Meltzer, or if you are following all things wrestling, if you have seen a bit of Will Ospreay's work since before he came to AEW, that, and you know the backstory about how long Brian Danielson has been wanting to work with Will Ospreay, but it just kind of seemed as though these weird things came into play, and for whatever respect or reason, bad timing. And to finally get these guys squaring off, and we have them squaring off on pay-per-view. Only place to see these guys fight one-on-one -on -one is on pay-per-view. High marks for Tony Khan, making sure MoFo's paid to see these two wrestle. This was a instant classic. It lived up to the hype. Everything that it was supposed to be from everybody reacting over in the comment section on 401 Mania while it was live to people on social media, Discord, all that. Universally, we're all going, yo, smash, freaking rock. Pretty damn close to perfection, too. I mean, Chef's Kiss, um, good stuff right there. I mean, this really, an uh, unreal match, an uh, unreal match. This really should have been a damn closer, honestly. I wish the pay-per-view could have been over at this point. But sadly, we had two more matches to go, and it's like, wow. Like, how do you top that energy? That these guys brought into this. Like seriously. And there's a lot of chatter that's going on right now. In regards to Brian Danielson. What's going on with his health. Because uh, for a lot of fans. It kind of seemed as though he took a pretty bad uh, bump or two. In this matchup. I know towards the end of the match. Danielson was doing the yes chant in the corner. Well off spray. He takes off his elbow pad. He's ready to do the hidden blade. So this is a matter of two charging bulls coming at one another, opposite directions. Who's gonna connect first? And Osprey was able to connect with the hidden blade. Then he goes for the Tiger Driver 93. Hidden blade again. One, two, three, bada bing, bada boom. That's it. It's over. Stick a fork in it, man. 
Uh, it was a great finish. I, I loved it. Uh, post-match, we got doctors tending to Danielson. Uh, we've got uh, even Wallspray is checking in constantly on Danielson to see how's he doing. And it would appear as though um, one of those last Tiger drivers legit did some type of damage to Danielson. I mean, he was cursing his ass off. But then you're going, wait a minute. Man, he's selling this really good. I mean, is, is this maybe a work? Is it, And if it is a work, you're kind of going, as a longtime fan of Danielson, this is a bit distasteful, dog, because you've got so many fans that – that have been invested in you for years. A lot of people, and I always stress it, if you haven't read his book, pick up his book. It's so raw, so emotional uh, with that book, especially when he talks about his father and everything. It's a really great read. Pick it up. But, you know, you, we've had this connection with Danielson for so long, and, you know, we know how much it meant to him to try to get back to the ring, even when he thought, it was impossible, and, you know, to hear the idea that Danielson was just putting on some extra performance there just to sell, but he's okay, you're going, oh, that's distasteful, please don't, don't do that, right? Osprey seemed legit concerned, wanted to help. So, again, this is where... The media scrum comes into play. By the way, if anybody has a couple of highlights that they want to share in real time while we're still on the air about some of these points that we're making right now, feel free to sound off, and I'll definitely show you guys some love and all that. Uh, but before we go off there, I'm hoping that we'll be able to get just a couple of little snippets of uh, you know some of our questions, some of our concerns that we'll be able to relay uh, to you guys and everything. Worst case scenario, we're coming right back Monday night after Raw goes off the air and everything. So, look, we only got... But I love this match. I love this match. I cannot sing enough praise about this match. Um, I know some people even jumped out there and said, yo, you know, you can finish your story, but as far as the wrestling match of the year goes... Yo, this is it right here. Now, if you want to talk about story, you know what? I'll give it to you. If you legit, hey, Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes from this year's WrestleMania, you want me to take that for all it's worth and have that go head to head with what I saw in Brian Danielson and uh, Will Ospreay tonight and go, which was the better match? I will definitely give you all that. Truly, you know, true wrestling fans that appreciate wrestling from all promotions. I will give you that. I will give you Danielson, Osprey was the better match. But as far as the better story, hands down, Cody, Roman, the bloodline, finish the story without a doubt. So they're both winners in respected categories. I really hope that everybody can truly pump the brakes and catch their cell, catch themselves when they're saying, you know, Hey, you guys can have, right. I hope they really know what they're saying when they put that out there, because you have some that's saying it just to try to throw shade at WWE. Uh, you know, and then I think you have those that are definitely consciously aware that what they're saying is, Yeah. This was the great story, but this was the match right here. So definitely with that. So, yeah, good stuff. I love that. I love that. I might watch that match again. I got to say, that was definitely a really good high point. That should have been the end of the pay-per-view. But we had two more matches to go. AEW Tag Team Championship ladder match. Real ladders were used. FTR versus the Young Bucks. Young Bucks winning those championships, getting a little bit of help from a returning Jack Perry. 21 minutes, 36 seconds, final moments of this matchup. A maxed man gets in the ring, shoves the ladder. I believe Dax was on the ladder. Security dive in on him. 
uh, and he gets his uh, hands behind his back, right? So he's surrendering peacefully and everything. They pull the mask off, and it's revealed to be Jack Perry. <laughs> uh, where's my crickets? Ah, there we go. Can, so can, can we do that one more time? Yeah. Mask comes off. It's revealed to be Jack Perry. Ah, yeah. Nice, arrogant, smug look uh, on his face. The kind that you just want to knock off or, 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 or maybe just a little choke, right? Just a little choke, right? A little choke. So all that commotion is going on. Nicholas Jackson manages to climb the ladder, retrieve the titles. Boom. New tag team champions crowned that way. 21 minutes, 36 seconds. What do I say about this match? I, I got to be honest with you guys. I didn't care for this match. I did not care for this match. There was just what really did it for me, honestly, was just the CM Punk footage. And this isn't the CM Punk fan in me that my whole thing was, man, you could have told the story that you needed to tell without even going in that direction. You essentially had enough substance right there and everything. So just go with what you got. You don't need to come off like you're desperate for viewership, like you're desperate for some type of a pop, for some type of uh, media engagement and all that. Just do what you got to do, right? This match definitely could have been trimmed down a bit on time as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you did have some crazy... Uh, you know, in, you know, insane spots that was going on in this one where all the participants were putting their bodies through some hellacious, I mean, tables, real ladders. Yeah, there's definitely some moments there where you're going, let's just stop this already. This is getting a little bit right. And I appreciate the fact that as far as, okay, you're going to bleed. I like that the blood consumption pretty much had all went down in this matchup, right? So n nice to see the boys get some color in there and everything. Um, but this was like a, a crash test dummy spot fest type of match uh, as far as I was concerned. Uh, I wish they could have done a better job selling some of those insane spots rather than just, you know, essentially pop right back up and all that. Right. Decent. You know, but wasn't really my cup of tea. Was not really my cup of tea. Main event match. AEW World Championship. Samoa Joe defending the championship against Swerve Strickland. Give that man a championship. Swerve Strickland coming out. Dressed from head to toe. Mask and all. Black Panther inspired costume. I was really feeling that. You got Prince Nana coming out with the cape. You know, kind of almost had like a James Brown type of moment going on. Loved it. Great entrance. Great match. We got ourselves a, uh, for the first time ever in AEW history, a uh, black world heavyweight champion. And his name is Swerve Strickland. Put a big old smile. On this young man's face uh, right here. Uh, I love this. I love this. I, I can't believe it happened. I honestly said to myself, holy crap. It, it, it actually went down. We actually, holy crap. Swerve Strickland not only became a made man, but he became the first AEW World Heavyweight Champion. And it's so funny because I remember a couple of years back, I was saying, man, you know, it wasn't even really a race about race for me at the time. It was just about look at these potential superstars in the making. And I remember saying Will Hobbs, uh, Swerve Strickland, Ricky Starks, Darby Allen. These guys definitely would be really good world heavyweight champions 
under the right circumstances. Of course, when the time is right, right? Hey, icing on the cake that they're black because honestly, let me tell you something. As a person of color, it's nice to be able to see people that look just like me that are in these really cool positions, right? It, it, it's badass. I can't tell you. It's no different than, you know, and it's not really a race thing. It's just about tapping into that certain demographic. That's the best way I can describe it. Like I can remember, for instance, and it ties back to Swerve winning the championship. I can remember a, a time when I was a kid, and as far as cartoons goes, the main heroes, it was just always white, 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 right? Just an observation. And then, man, what comes along? Can anybody think of the first cartoon that came along with a black superhero? If you need a hint, all you got to do is go back to around the late... 90s going into the early 2000s and one of the first joints that came out was Static Shock Static Shock and then going to the live action format you know this show does not get its respected props and uh, shout out to Cress Williams because he, he knew what time it was because I, I interviewed him I think after the first season of Black Lightning was in the books and we had talked about it and everything, and uh, he brought up a good point, and I totally had forgot about it until he brought it up. But a lot of people had wanted to credit Black Lightning for, hey, you're the first live-action you know, black superhero you know, before Luke Cage. And, and I remember Chris Williams was like, no, 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 no. He's like, we got to pump the brakes. Like, I, I wasn't the first. He's like, the first was actually... Mantis. He's like, you remember Mantis? And I was like, I said, that, oh, hell yeah. I was like, I, that was my show. Like, hell yeah. I remember Mantis. Look that up. It was on Fox. Short-lived one season. So I, I can't tell you as a person of color, like, you know, hey, where's that, you know, that I can, because it's nice being able to turn to your favorite show and you can find that character that you can relate to among the other fun characters that they have, right? It's no different than when a female is checking out that wrestling show with her significant other, and they want to see somebody that is not only like them, a woman, but is also maybe a person of color and you know has the same kind of hair as them, and they're in a marquee role in everything. So to see this go down for Swerve Strickland, right? So we've talked about race, right? But let's really home in on the fact of how talented of a brother this man is in that ring. So goddamn talented. He really, really is. It's just mind-blowing to this very day that he unfortunately was released from the WWE because I think that if Triple H, Paul Levesque, and everybody else was in charge... I think to this day, Swerve would still be in the WWE. But, but, you got to put an asterisk by it. I can confidently sit here and say to you, just looking at the current trajectory of what all's been going on and everything, I can confidently say to you, he wouldn't have became a world champion by now. We'd have been lucky if he would have even gotten a taste of the IC title or United States Championship. By now, everything happens for a reason. That's what I always say. I know a lot of people want to focus on, man, I can't believe they released that guy. That's so wrong. They did him dirty. And But I've always been a firm believer in everything happens for a reason. And AEW, right place, right time for Swerve Strickland, who has just been chip, chip, chipping away. Definitely making a really good argument for himself past handful of years. Hey, I should be considered for, you know, best male wrestler uh, of the year. Like when you're talking about just his matches alone and everything, consistency has continued to be there for this man. And uh, 
you know, that St. Louis crowd, that was definitely the right crowd to do it in front of. They were all there for that moment. You know, it's kind of funny because I kind of felt, I don't know how many of you guys felt this way as well, but there was a part of me that was wondering if Hangman Adam Page was going to come out and spoil the festivities because he, remember in storyline, he always said to Swerve, yo, you know, we're not done. If I can't have the AEW World Championship, you can't either, right? I'm going to be there every single step of the way making sure you're denied, right? And I was looking for that Hangman Page appearance, but uh, it did not happen in in this one, Uh, which is good, I guess, unless he doesn't swerve, that is, doesn't get to celebrate that long, and we go to the next Dynamite, and Hangman is all up in his face, right? Got to wait and see what's going to happen. This coming week and everything. But um, this put a big old smile on my face. Seeing Swerve Strickland as the new champion. Because I've seen how hard this young man has continued to bust his ass week in, week out. All right? He's all he's all about that business when it comes to that ring. And, and, and I appreciate that hustle. I, I see what he's doing. And I'm loving it right now. Final moments. Of this matchup, we had Samoa Joe heading to the floor, grabbing his championship. But Swerve comes at him with a running knee right as Joe entered the ring. Joe's hanging over the middle rope. Boom, 450 splash, followed up by the Swerve stomp near fall. Joe then rakes the eyes after coming back to a vertical base. Has that belt again. Swerve grabs it. Takes a swing, but Joe catches him, puts him in that coquina clutch. Looks like Swerve is about to pass out, but my man is still in it. Grabs the arm, traps it behind Joe, pulls off a snap, gets back to his feet, hits the house call. That gets him another near fall. Finally, Swerve goes to the top rope. Joe ends up pushing him down, tries to grab him for a muscle buster, kind of looked like to me. But Swerve managed to avoid it. Power bombs Joe to the canvas. Swerve stomp connects. And a three count. New champion crown that way. Badass moment. Love this match. Great chemistry uh, between all of these guys. Uh, I I wish we could have done without the tag match between Bucks, FTR. Uh, Maybe that could have been a little bit more. So look, we're all, I think we all could be in agreement. Jericho Hook probably shouldn't have happened. Take that match out. And then if you still got to have FTR and the Bucks, maybe trim that down a little bit more. The fact that Swerve, Samoa Joe, they went as long as they did, which by my clock, I had them at about the 18-minute mark. That's actually a decent of enough time. Tell your story and everything. You know, do what you need to do. Um Isn't it weird, though, like when you go back and look at some of these other matches that I'm talking about, right? For instance, Danielson, Osprey, 32 minutes. Then you go to, uh, then you go to Okada, Pac. They had damn near 22 minutes, right? You go to Young Bucks, FTR, they get damn near 22 minutes. And And you're like, wait a minute. But the World Heavyweight Championship for AEW, it only gets almost 18 minutes, give or take. Like, come on, no, this should have a little bit more time without being overkill. Now, I can't, I think many of us can appreciate the fact that Strickland, Joe, it wasn't overkill what they did here. But a damn good feeling. And, you know, don't just take my word for everything that I'm saying. Because I know some people will get caught up on the whole, why everything got to be about race? Well, I, I just explained it to you just now, right? So, but I also noticed, I said, okay, put that to the side. Let's just talk about how talented Swerve Strickland is. Like, if there's anybody that you go, who should be the next AEW World Heavyweight Champion? You're looking at Swerve Strickland, and you're going, that's the guy. You're not even going there because of race. You're just going, from what I've been seeing for a good minute, Swerve's that guy. Tag, he's it. And it's just so awesome to see unanimously on social media, everybody going, 
hell yeah, about damn time. If they're not saying any of those things, yes, right guy, right place, right time, hell yeah. Then you got others that's recognizing that and then also saying, hell yeah, first black AEW World Heavyweight Champion and it's Swerve Strickland. Oh man, this is badass. This is cool. You know, um, you know, it's not so much everything that I've seen so far, it's not so much about the fact that he's black and AEW has made history. It's mainly on the side of yo, Swerve did it. No matter how you want to cut it, like unanimously, everybody is happy that Swerve uh, is that man. And, and, and that's what really matters. So there's your 12 matches, three of which were your pre-show. So for me, low point, definitely hook Chris Jericho. Could have done without it. High point, you know, despite what I said about Swerve Strickland and, and, and all of that, I still got to go with Will Ospreay, Brian Danielson. That was definitely, we could have trimmed it back a little bit on the time length, but that was definitely a damn good match. I loved it. I loved it. My overall grade, I'm going to grade this two ways. I'm going to grade it thinking about what I saw during zero hour, factor that in, and then I'll give you a grade just minus the matches from zero hour. Overall, Scale of 1 to 10, 1 being crap, 10 being awesome sauce. I would give AEW Dynasty a... Mm, I would give it a... Everything I saw, right, from zero hour. I would give it a... Yeah. Hmm. Seven and a quarter out of 10. Seven and a quarter out of 10. So I'm looking at it, grade letter scale, probably a B minus, a B minus. Now, eliminate those pre-show matches. I'm staying at a seven. So probably a B minus, right? Seven. I'm probably still going to be at about a B minus. For me, the main issue, time length. Some things could have been trimmed. You had some funky spots in there that I wasn't really a fan of. I cannot get out the Jericho hook match. And just how, you know, they tried. They struggled, though. Both of those guys, they struggled. Yeah. 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 The main two event matches, main event matches, Will Ospreay, Danielson, Strickland, Joe, that really kind of is maintaining that B minus, that that seven, right? But if you take those out of the equation, ooh, you're definitely looking at a lower rating when it's said and done. All right, let's go to X, formerly known as Twitter. Let's see what you guys had to say. We're doing fantastic on time length, by the way, I see we've only done about an hour, 13 minutes. You know, we'll, we'll do these polling results. I'll poke my head real quick on social media, see if Tony Khan has given any updates on Danielson and all of that. And then we'll definitely call it a night. Uh, by the way, shout out to the 32 plus people that's watching the stream via X right now. Got the poll up asking you guys, what did you think about AEW Dynasty? X community so far, we got a tie at 7% for terrible show and average show. Meanwhile, 30% of you are saying great show and top dog right now are saying uh, fantastic show. 53% of you saying fantastic show. Appreciate you guys via X. And it's still a little bit early on the YouTube communities page. Normally what happens once overnight is over, we go into you know, morning, beginning of the afternoon, that's when the votes really start tallying in and and people start letting their voices be heard on the YouTube poll. But right now I'm seeing a tie. 50% average show, 50% fantastic show. So still relatively early. Make sure you get your votes in and let your voices be heard. I'll follow up on the Monday night show after Raw goes off the air and reveal the final tally 
for how it's looking for you guys. Now, before we go off the air, I want to see what's going on as far as uh, the media scrum goes. So let me see what happens when I type in AW Dynasty and maybe I can find out some information that way. Uh, I don't think that's going to help. Let's say scrum. Maybe we can say scrum and we can kind of find out that way what's going on here. Uh, let's see. Oh, wow. The, uh, the scrum has just finished. That's a first. Usually those scrums go a lot longer than an hour, but shout out to JC Vasquez who's saying that the scrum only lasted a little bit over an hour. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm seeing Tony Khan praised Renee Paquette for her work. Okay. Apparently, Tony Khan revealed during the scrum that TBS is thrilled about tonight's pay-per-view. And uh, they continue to be happy with Dynamite and Collision. Uh, apparently, they text him right before the media scrum about the pay-per-view. So, apparently, they were watching. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm looking here. Okay, here's something. Will Ospreay just revealed at the AEW press scrum that he injured Brian Danielson with the Tiger driver. And as a result, he's officially retiring the move. Uh, he apparently put Brian Danielson over. Uh, and uh, what's this about sympathetic baby face? Let me read how, how this is being phrased here. He put over Brian. Oh, okay. Uh, this person is saying that Osprey is coming off like a sympathetic baby face. Okay. So uh, I don't know how much of that is true. Like, if, like if, if this is really legit or if this is part of a story arc, but take that news for what it's worth. Uh, apparently this transpired within the last, I guess, 20 minutes based on some of the interactions that I'm seeing here. But again, Osprey revealed at the press scrum that he injured Brian Danielson with the Tiger driver and he's officially retiring the move. So that's what's going on there. And let's see here. Let me open this up because somebody is adding a little bit more in regards to what uh, Osprey had to say at the scrum. Uh, shout out to Alex who says Osprey just said in the dynasty scrum that Brian had a real injury and it could be serious. He apologized for not seeing the doctor's signal to intervene and said he would not use the tiger driver 91 again to prevent this from happening uh, again. Wow. That is, yeah, you gotta be careful with that uh, tiger driver, man. Like I've, I've seen some of the best. I, I love it. I, I love the move. It's a badass move, but I cringe every single time um, I see that. So that is, oof. Looks like there's a lot of comments coming in about Tony Storm's appearance on the media scrum as well. She's always good. She usually delivers it uh, pretty, pretty good. Willow talked briefly. She talked about how she's happy. She also got to bring her family to see her. She talks about working for AEW during the pandemic and working hard to uh, get the job. She's uh, proud of her accomplishments. Facing Mercedes Monet, winning the Owen Cup, the Owen Hart Cup. I almost forgot she won that. Facing Athena in the ROH main event. She gave a shout out to the journalist that asked her questions as they were all uh, female, apparently. Uh, she's also proud to represent AEW and New Japan CMLL stardom. She's willing to put her championship on the line against anyone from those respected companies. And apparently tonight was Willow's first time defeating Julia Hart. So those are some key notes there from... Uh, from Willow, shout out to uh, the guys over at Pro Wrestling and MMA News 
for those uh, bullet point highlights there. Good stuff. I'm just scrolling. I'm almost at the hour mark now trying to see. <laughs> Apparently, Swerve Strickland plugged his new shoe line in the middle of the media scrum. <laughs> <laughs> which he says it's not easy to walk in my shoes but if you want to these are my new swerve ones and tony khan's like a little kid just like oh these look badass they do look badass though i think i might actually uh pick me up a pair let's see i actually might pick me up a pair yeah, Renee Picat is getting a lot of compliments. Apparently, they're saying they like the way that this scrum was organized. Uh, the flow of it was uh, was better. There's still some people saying, "Yo, he's Tony Khan. He's not really needed at the scrums." Some people are wanting to know what's going on with the status of Keith Lee. Apparently, that question was not uh, asked. Maybe next time. So, yeah, I'm seeing the scrum now. The full length. It ran about an hour. 13 minutes. I probably might check that out sometime Monday just to see if I missed anything from, uh, you know, what the highlights that we went over uh, just far and everything. But those are some of the bullet points. Let's see what some of the people have to say about the pay-per-view overall tonight. Let's read a couple of comments from uh, our good friends over at cage net cagematch.net right now the overall rating for the pay-per-view is sitting at an 8.95 out of 10 let's uh look at you know how we do it you know the drill by now we look at the most critical review a middle grounded review right most positive review I'm going to start with the most positive. See if I can find something that's pretty. Like this one from N. Gilbert, who gave it a 10 out of 10. Top to bottom, one of the greatest professional wrestling cards I've ever seen. If you don't like a show like that, then AEW isn't for you. Incredible opener from Pac and Okada, which led into a awesome trios match. And then a wonderful crowning of the new TBS champion, Willow. Roddy and Cal had an absolute banger. For the international title and the women's title match was both ladies best outing in a long time. And man, what else can you say about the final three matches? Just perfection when it comes to professional wrestling. Oh, what a night. Let's look for our most critical rating. I'm looking. I am looking. So if I'm seeing this right, most critical, most critical is a seven. I'm going to go with Destino. Destino, seven out of 10. What a roller coaster of a show. Started off pretty strong with Pac and Okada. Then it kind of fell off until the international title match. Jericho match almost killed the show for me with that nasty match. <laughs> Laugh out loud. <laughs> uh, and he should have not beaten Hook. Laugh out loud. Both women's matches were good. Tony's best match. Yeah, it was. You know, it, it, it actually was. I kind of I kind of glanced over it there a little bit. But this was one of Tony Storm's better slash best title defenses really great dance partner there and thunder rosa uh who surprised me tonight rare that i see thunder rosa in a match where she's not wearing the traditional makeup and i'm like oh i get to see all of her cuteness for what for once right yeah i have an idea how half of her actual face looks without the makeup but it's my first time seeing her in a match without any face paint on you know, and she's just got the extravagant eyelashes, mascara going on. And it's like, oh, OK, cool. I, I liked it. I liked it. She's cute. She's got a natural cuteness to her. I like it. Uh, let's see. What else do you say here? Osprey versus Danielson was generational. This was one of the best matches of the year. I'll give you that. Great showcase for Osprey. Last two matches fell kind of flat for me. 
Jack Perry making his return was kind of eh, but it is what it is. Main event match was pretty garbage, but a very good feel moment for Swerve Strickland being the first black world champion in company history. Solid stuff. Yeah, you know, something was a little bit off. I liked the match, but something was off there between Joe and, uh, uh, God damn it, between Joe and... I know why I'm drawing a blank. Uh, for the love of God, man, get it out. Swerve Strickland. Something was off with that match. I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And I know they both were, right? Swerve definitely, like, he was fine. Joe was fine. But there was something, maybe at this point, just the fact that we were almost clocking in on four hours. Maybe that's what it was. Because I promise you, if one of the first things I do after... I walk my dogs, I catch up on my emails, uh, you know, and, and classwork and all that for the day. I bet you if I were to sit down and at some point just go out of my way to watch that match again, I might feel different than I do right now. But for me, something fell off. Execution was fine by both men, but something fell off. And again, maybe it was just the length of the overall pay-per-view. Because at this point, it's like, let's send it home already. Uh, let's see. So that was that. So we read what? We read a most positive. We did a you know, middle of the road, right? Or, or was that like most critical? Uh, we did a middle. And that's, if this is a 7 out of 10, it's pretty much a middle of the road, right? We read a... We read a most positive one. I am not seeing a critical one. Right now, believe it or not, I'll refresh this one more time just to make sure we're not missing anything here. Wait a minute. I thought I saw something critical. Hang on. Let me just scroll down. I thought I saw a four, but I probably was seeing things. I have a feeling I was seeing things. Yeah, your man was seeing things. I apologize. I was about to say, damn, a four? Yeah, I think usually when it hits, like, the danger colors there, it starts to go uh, orange and yellow and then red. Then you're kind of like, oh, man, that's messed up. But no, like, so far, majority of the people commenting, if they're not giving a 7, they're giving a 9 uh, or 8. I tell you what, I'll read to you a 8 out of 10 rating. I'm looking for one that's, you know, kind of, Kind of short and sweet. Uh, I guess I'll go by Arisen by. Actually, no, no. Give me an eight. Give me a short eight. Hang on. That was actually a nine. Give me an eight. Where is an eight? I'm looking for a short eight out of ten. But it does. Yeah, here we go. S. Jones. Eight out of ten. Okada versus Pac. Nine out of ten. Adam Copeland, Eddie Kingston, Mark Briscoe versus Malachi Black, Buddy Matthews and Brody King, 8 out of 10. Willow Nightingale versus Julia Hart, 5 out of 10. So far, I got no issues with how he's rating this. Roderick Strong versus Kylie O'Reilly, 8 out of 10. Jericho versus Hook, 3 out of 10. I, I am like right there with him so far. Tony Storm versus Thunder Rosa, 7 out of 10. Yeah. Well, Lawspray versus Brian Danielson, 10 out of 10. Ah, I don't know about 10 out of 10. I don't know about 10 out of 10. Uh, I don't know about 10 out of 10, but at the rate that he's going right now with these numbers, I probably would go... I probably would go 9 out of 10 for that match. And for me, nothing else would even match that number for the rest of the matches that come after it. That's how I would rate it. All right, let's see what else you got here. Uh, da, 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 da. Bucks versus Wheeler and Hardwood, 9 out of 10. Now, come on, dude. Really? 9 out of 10? No, that's that, that match. Hmm. Six and a quarter, six and a half out of ten for me. Swerve Strickland versus Samoa Joe, nine out of ten. 
7 out of 10. I'll come back to that on Monday's show. 7 out of 10. AEW Dynasty, 7 and a half, 8. He's, so he's, he's leaning more towards an 8. Final thoughts, he says, impressive pay-per-view, many incredible moments, and what he believes is a match of the year. Definitely assuming he's talking about Osprey and Danielson. However, some parts lacking and some questionable booking decisions all factor into keeping this from a 9 out of 10. Okay, I like some. What do you guys think? I like some of his ratings there. I think there's definitely some in there that's a little bit uh, too high, though. Yeah, definitely some that's a little bit too high. Uh, hey, Mish, what's up with you, buddy? He would have been a supplemental champ by now. Easy. Yeah, definitely. He would not be tasting no championship gold right now. That's for damn sure. That is for damn sure. How did I miss your comment? And I thought I was looking at what everybody was saying in the chat there. That is, see, now I got to go back. Hang on, guys. Because at one point, I did have the YouTube chat open, but I didn't see any uh, any comments uh, pop up there. So there's like a weird funky delay that's going on. Kind of weird there. But yeah, yeah, I'm still leaning. We'll talk about it again on the Monday night show, but my rating as it stands right now, I'm, I'm leaning towards a seven and a quarter for the pay-per-view overall. B minus, I'm almost leaning towards... No, no, you know what? It was an enjoyable because I was going to say C plus, but no, I'm willing to just stay at a B minus. Even when we come back to this less than 24 hours, I'm I'm still going to say a, a B minus for the card without a doubt. But you guys keep voting and sound off. Let me know what you guys had thought about the pay-per-view. And in the meantime, I want you all to be kind. Rewind. Check out previous episodes you might have missed on demand and on the downloads, wherever you get your podcast, just search the RCWR show. Check out friends of the show as well. Shout out to Mitch Thomas and Joe Numbers of Wrestling Soup. Show those guys some love. Shout out to my guy, Julian Cannon of Digiday and Wrestling Court. Make sure you show him some love as well. I cannot wait to hear what uh, uh, Jim Cornette and Eric Bischoff have to say. Uh, about the pay-per-view more so uh cornet uh but i do appreciate bischoff's take bischoff's been bringing it a lot more as of late a lot of fundamental hey you, you can't argue with that one i'm very curious to see what they think about the uh pay-per-view as well see if they're going to be in that same realm of rating the pay-per-view overall and everything coming at you live monday night April 22nd, 2024, minutes after WWE Raw goes off the air. Join us for that. I'll be sounding off on these recent WWE releases, trying to make sense out of them. I know I had a lot of people talking about it. I'll definitely get into that. Some interesting news had came about with TikTok as well. We'll go into the details on that one. I'll also sound off on what I think about the NBA playoffs so far, who I think is going to be going all the way for the NBA finals. So it's going to be a really good show. We're going to be going all over the place on that one. So make sure you guys tune in. Until next go round, wishing all y'all to be safe. Most importantly, be kind to one another. Those of you that are going to be wanting to check out the audio version of this, give me about 45 minutes and... It'll be available for your listening pleasure. Peace, y'all. Take care.